Now, if, if you don't mind showing the picture that I asked you, yes. Do you know this guy? His name is Master Yoda. And he's arguably the wisest of all the Jedi Masters. He speaks slowly and quietly. And some of his phrases are very short, but profound. Short and profound. That is the makeup of the passage of today. It presents three exhortations that are short and yet profound, important, applicable, relevant. This passage from Colossians calls you and me to, number one, pray steadfastly. Number two, manage time wisely. Or as Yoda will say, wisely manage your time, you must. <laughs> okay, now I, I derailed the whole thing, so I have to start all over in point number one. <laughs> Don't worry, Kevin, this is as much as we're going to talk about Star Wars, no more. <laughs> okay, let's start all over again. This passage in Colossians calls you and me to number one, pray steadfastly. Number two, to manage our time wisely. And number three, to speak graciously. Those are three of the nuggets of instruction that this passage presents us today. So I will please ask you to open your Bibles in the book of Colossians, uh, chapter 4. We're in a series on this book for those who are visiting us. And we are about to, we are getting to the end of it. We are in the last chapter. And today we are going to read verses 2 through 6 of chapter 4 of the book of Colossians. So if you please read with me as we read the word of God. Verse 2, Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Verse 5, walk in wisdom toward outsiders making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Pray with me. Lord, as we come to your word, you are so wise as on how you orchestrated bringing Paul today and sharing all the things that are happening and I pray that this message will be in the hearts of the people here connected with, with what he talked about, about praying and, and being wise and, and speaking, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and even being in prison for the sake of the gospel. I pray that your spirit will, will fill me and will equip me and will give me clarity of of thought and clarity of speech that you will overcome my weaknesses as a preacher and that you will speak to us by your Holy Spirit through your word. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. So as you may recall, uh, last week Kevin preached about life revolving around Christian's household. Now, the message of today, we will learn from this passage about the Christian life beyond households. The Apostle Paul in this passage instructs us, instructs the Colossians how to live, how to conduct themselves. And he focuses in particular in these three exhortations, encouraging them to pray steadfastly, to manage time wisely, and to speak graciously. We will follow that sequence derived directly from the text of today. And right now we're going to start in exhortation number one, pray 
steadfastly. In verse 2, Paul starts this section saying, continue steadfastly in prayer. You may be wondering, what does steadfastly mean? So I looked it up, and this is what the dictionary says. Steadfastly, steadfastly means strongly and without stopping. So what the text is saying here is pray strongly and without stopping. Pray steadfastly, tenaciously, constantly, regularly. Persevere, persist, and devote yourself to prayer. Be resolute, firm, and unwavering in your praise. Pray without stopping steadfastly. Wow. Can you do that? Based on what Paul says here, and elsewhere, apparently, he can. If you recall, at the beginning of this same book of, the, of Colossians, in chapter 1, 9, he said, we have not ceased to pray for you. And in 1 Thessalonians, he also says, pray without ceasing. It sounds like Paul is praying a lot, and he expects Christians to pray a lot too. But I always wondered, if he's praying all the time, then when does he have time to evangelism or to study the Word of God or to work, you know? Paul is just like the rest of us. He has his own job just like us. He's a tent maker. So when he says continue steadfastly in prayer, does he mean that we should be on our knees all the time? Well, I, I don't think so because otherwise we wouldn't have time to do anything else. But prayer is a sign of dependence on God. God knows what we need before we even open our mouths, but, but we need to pray as an expression of our humble dependence on Him, our need of Him in everything we do. Prayer also helps us to develop and grow a relationship with God. So this verse is not calling us to, to be in our knees all the time necessarily, but to, to have an intentional, a constant, a steadfast dependence on God, an orientation toward Him, building up a relationship with Him. Now you may be wondering, how does this look like in practice, in my day-to-day, -day, in my life? If I am at a school and I have a test, I pray, Lord, please help me remember what I studied. Or if I am crazy busy at home, almost losing my mind, I ask, Lord, I need your strength. Give me patience and grace. If I am taking a walk after dinner, I pause for a few seconds, marveling at the beautiful sunset as I praise the Creator with a, with a short prayer. If, if I'm at work and I'm stuck trying to, to solve this problem, I stop for a few seconds and I acknowledge, Lord, this problem is too hard for me, but not for you. Would you direct me to the solution? If your child gets into an accident and you're rushing to the ER, you just cry, Lord, help! And that's enough. He hears your prayer. So whether your prayers are short or long, we pray steadfastly, constantly, regularly, in complete dependence on God, acknowledging that you need Him everywhere, all the time, in all circumstances. You pray steadfastly. But as you continue steadfastly in prayer, you should be watchful in it with thanksgiving. That is what Paul says next. The second part of verse 2, being watchful in it, that's prayer, with thanksgiving. Now, being watchful means being vigilant, being alert, observing closely with our eyes wide open. And according to this text, we should be watchful looking for reasons to give thanks. You can picture here a watchman who is in a tower, who is looking, who is alert, who is seeking, who is watching. And he says, there, there, God is at work there. Thank you, Lord. There, 
My son demonstrated selflessness. Thank you, Lord. There. My friend was patient and kind to me. Thank you, God. There. My co-worker asked about my faith. Thank you, Jesus. We pray steadfastly without ceasing on the look for reasons to thank God. At the same time, we also pray for gospel opportunities. Read with me verse 3. At the same time, says Paul, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. Here, the mystery of Christ and the word, they both refer to the gospel. So what, Apostle, what the Apostle Paul is asking the Colossians is to pray that God may open a door to proclaim the gospel. Now, if you are like me, you are not having gospel conversations left and right. These opportunities are actually rare, almost completely absent. Now, you may assume that because you, you're not a missionary or you're not an evangelist, then that's not your gift. And therefore, you're tempted to abandon the whole thing altogether. Well, you're not alone. At least I myself am with you in this boat. And I suspect that there's many people that are in the same boat with us. Now, could it be that we do not have opportunities to share the gospel because we are not steadfastly praying and asking God to open the door so we can get these gospel conversations? You may remember that at the beginning of January, we had a guest speaker. His name was Scott Red. He, he taught to us uh, from the book of Luke, uh, chapter 9. And in his message, he exhorted all of us to pray that God will give us a heart to proclaim his kingdom and opportunities to do it. So I remember thinking after the message, almost in a dismissive way, <laughs> as if my petition alone to have opportunities would change much of anything. I do not recall making the prayer with anticipation or much faith. It was more like, okay, Lord, the preacher asked me to pray for opportunities about the gospel. So here I am, over. Around that time, someone totally random made me aware of a group of Christians at work that I was just not aware of. It turns out that this group of people were, are super active. And one of their initiatives is to match employees that want to learn more about Christianity or grow in their faith, uh, match them with employees that are willing to disciple them. So I sign up as a discipler. And just a few days later, I receive a list of 30 people that wanted to be disciple. 30 people with, with my simple prayer, dismissive prayer, right, almost right immediately. And I was like, I, I don't have time for 30. We need more people. So I pick one, and we're having gospel conversations. So pray, pray, pray. Let us follow Paul's instruction. Let us pray that God will open a door to us to declare the mystery of Christ, the word, the gospel. Now, Paul continues in, in verse 3. He says, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Paul writes this letter from prison. He's captive on an account of the gospel. Because of his bold and persistent proclamation of the gospel, a message that is intensely rejected by the Jews and at best ignored by the Romans. And since they could not silence Paul, now they put him in prison. He's their captive. And I couldn't but think about what, what Paul from Nepal or who, who is in Nepal was telling us. Preaching the gospel is sometimes costly, very costly. 
Now, if you carefully read any letter from the Apostle Paul, you cannot miss the fact that he's totally and completely devoted to the gospel. His goal in life is to proclaim the gospel everywhere at all costs, even if it costs him his freedom. Actually, even if it costs him his life, he wants to proclaim the gospel. And we read that in Colossians chapter 1, if you recall, verse 28. Him we proclaim, is speaking about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, says Paul, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. With all the energy that God supplies, he wants to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul's life revolves around the gospel. He lives to proclaim it, and he's willing to die as he proclaims the gospel. But what about you and me? What is it that you are passionate about? What are you willing to die for, to live for? Is it your, your career, your family, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your studies, your favorite sport, your house, your stock? What is it? What keeps you up at nine and springs you out of bed every morning? What is it that consumes most of your thoughts, your actions, your mental and physical energy? According to what Paul writes in these letters, for him, that was Christ and his gospel. Now, you and I are not the Apostle Paul, and there are aspects of his role that we are not called to fulfill at all. But could it be that through the letters of the New Testament, God is communicating what should be also important, central, essential, and critical in your life and in mine? Yes, we pray for God to open the doors to proclaim the gospel. And we also pray that God will give us the desire to look for those doors. So we may be walking through our lives looking around for doors all over the place and then asking God to open this door, open this door. To give us the privilege and the honor to use our mouths to proclaim the sublime, the weighty, the life or death message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I need to pray that God will break through our busyness, our lethargy, and our ignorance. That he will inflame our affections toward him. So that we may live on this earth centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. In verse 4, he continues, Paul continues, that I may make it clear. That is that I may make the gospel clear. Not only I pray that God will open the doors for me to proclaim the gospel, but I also pray that God will give me the ability to proclaim the gospel with clarity, with precision, making it visible, intelligible, desirable, and understandable. Who is equipped to do that? I am not. Are you? Maybe not. And that's why exactly we have to pray and cry out, Lord, please grant me to proclaim your gospel and to make it clear, to overcome my limitations, and by the power of your spirit to let me make it no intelligible and attractive to others. So that's the exhortation number one. Summarizing it, it goes like this. Let us pray steadfastly, firmly, tenaciously, being watchful with thanksgiving, asking God to open the doors to proclaim the gospel with clarity, with precision, and with passion. Now exhortation number two. Manage time wisely. Read with me verse 5 of chapter 4. Paul says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. 
Walk in wisdom, Paul exhorts, in particular toward outsiders. What he means is non-Christians, unbelievers. So, so when they see how I live, they may notice that there's something radically different about how I approach life. The way you conduct yourself before outsiders, whether at work, in your neighborhood, at a school, really matters. Non-Christians and unbelievers should see that your life has a different orientation than the rest of the world. Specifically, Paul here focuses on how we make use of our time. He says, walk wisely towards outsider, making the best use of the time. Time is precious. It is not renewable. You cannot borrow time. You cannot pay it back. Once it's gone, it's gone. Today is May 5th, 2020, 20, 2024. Tomorrow will be May 6th, 2024. And May 5th will never come back. It's gone. Never, ever will come back. And that's why Paul here calls us to make the best use of the time. We need to maximize and to optimize how we manage it. That doesn't mean that we are productivity machines filling every single second with meetings and activities. But what, the, what it means is that we humbly and wisely recognize that time is actually a scarce resource. That we only have one life. And that we do not know how long it's going to last. And therefore, we want to make the best use of every moment that we have in this earth, seeking the will of the Lord for our lives and having an eternal perspective, doing what really matters according to God. My children are quickly approaching college age. My oldest just has two more years of high school. Time just flies. It just goes so fast. It feels to me like yesterday when they were these little munchkins running around the house laughing and playing. And now I have my oldest for just two more years. Time goes, goes by and never comes back. And I'm acutely aware of this reality. I want to make much of these last two years that I have with her. I do not want to waste any moment. Everything else can wait. Watching the sports can wait. My career can wait. Even most of my pastoral responsibilities, they can wait. But once my kids are gone, they are gone. And I cannot go back in time. The realization of their imminent departure sets everything to me in a different perspective. The way I organize my time and the priorities that I set in my calendar, they all are affected as I ponder and I think about that reality. They are living, she's living in two years. And I want to use time wisely. You know what? That is the same way I should think about time in general. My life is also short, very short. And I will not always be here. As the old poem puts it, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. How are you walking your life? Will people around you recognize this unusual wisdom in the way you spend your time in every sphere? I see here many young people, some of them about to graduate, some of them getting close there. If you're young, don't waste your time. It's precious. 
Make the best use of the time. Study hard. Work hard. Have a lot of fun. All for the glory of God. As you go through college, as you start your career, think about how you can maximize your time to reflect and mirror God and honor Him with the unique gifts that He has granted you. There are new inventions to be developed, new discoveries to be found, many people to be held, new order to be brought, new planets and stars and galaxies to be found, observe and admire as you worship God in the journey. There's a lot to tell others, to tell them that all things were made by Jesus, created through Him and for Him, that He's before all things, and in all of the things that are held together by Him, that in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and that through Him all things were reconciled by the blood of His cross. There are so much to say, and there's so little time. There's so much to do. Young man. Young woman, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. And if you're not young, the weight of this exhortation should feel even more acute. I do not need to tell you about the shortness of life and the exorbitant value of time, but just let me remind you and exhort you Walk in wisdom in this last season of your life, making the best use of the time. Manage your time wisely. That's exhortation number two. Exhortation number three, speak graciously. Read with me verse six. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Speech, the way you speak, the words you speak matter. In the final day, said Jesus, you will give an account of every careless word that you spoke, each one of them. You will have to be in front of him and explain why you use that careless word. Paul here exhorts us to be gracious in our speech, not occasionally, not even most of the time, but always, he says, let your speech always be gracious. A gracious speech is marked by kindness and courtesy, charm and winsomeness. Our speech should also be seasoned with salt, he says. What, what does he mean by being seasoned with salt? I like steak. In fact, I love a good cut, grill at the right temperature, nicely seasoned, flavorful, juicy steak. I'm getting hungry right now. You know, when I was growing up, I was never trained to cook or to grill. But I didn't need training to eat and to taste. When I started learning how to grill, I was worried that the steak will not come out flavorful enough. But I was gladly surprised to realize that seasoning the steak beforehand with the right amount of salt and letting it sit there for a while can make a huge difference on how the steak tastes after grilling it. Salt by itself makes it very tasteful and delightful. That is how our speech should be. Tasteful and delightful for the hearers. Seasoned with salt. Last part of verse 6. So that you may know how you ought to answer each person. This instruction does not explicitly explain to answer what. So it can be applied in general. 
Now, if you consider specifically the immediate context about the proclamation of the gospel, we can apply it there. That is, when we share and proclaim the gospel, we should do it graciously and kindly. Not with an I know it all or I am right and you are wrong type of attitude. In fact, that will be a contradiction with the content of the gospel which soaks with, with grace and kindness. So when you're getting into a heated debate about the gospel or, or, or theology in general, make sure that you check yourself whether you are representing Christ well by letting your speech Always be gracious, seasoned with salt. Now, the verse does not confine a speech to just proclaiming the gospel. But it says you should answer to each person. And by extension, on any topic and any circumstance. So whether you're debating about politics or sports or the news, whether you are at work, at school, or at home, let your speech Always be gracious. By the way, this also applies to social media. Facebook, Twitter, X, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, you name it. The way you communicate in social media, the way you share your thoughts, should always be graceful, tasteful, and edifying. Even more. We can also apply gracious speech at home. Since you interact with your family on a regular basis, every day, for years and decades, the way you speak to your children and your wife will have a significant impact in them. Therefore, let your speech always be gracious at home. I've preached a few times mentioning about my propensity to get angry at my kids and my wife. Someone pointed out recently that when I talk about this, I talk in very vague terms. And some people may be left questioning about how things actually play out when I say that. So I thought that it would be relevant here to shed some light on this matter. When I get angry, I do not express my anger physically at all. I do not either use language that is derogatory or insulting. In, in fact, sometimes my children do not even notice that I am angry. But I know what's going on inside. I'm aware that my tone sometimes is not gracious that my words sometimes are not gracious, seasoned with salt. That's why I want to pray that, that I can grow in this area, that my attitude will be of patience, of grace and kindness and love, and that those will influence my speech and my communication with my children and my wife. It is God himself in this verse that tells me, let your speech always be gracious. So I want to pay attention to what he's telling me and grow. Speak graciously. That's the exhortation number three. As we conclude this study, this sermon, some of you may be feeling convicted right now as you realize that you fall short in in some or all of these areas, prayer, wise use of time, and speech. As I conclude, let me remind you that before Paul went into instruction mode, he laid down the foundation of the gospel in the first half of the letter to the Colossians. Remember that Jesus paid for all your sins, failures, and shortcomings once and for all. Yes, you were once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds. But he has reconciled you in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless above all reproach before him. 
He has died for your sins. You do not have to work in any of these areas so you may gain or preserve your salvation. You can work to grow on all of them because you are already saved and because you belong to God and you are His child and His Spirit dwells within you and supplies the power to change. So let's ask God to help us and empower us to pray steadfastly, to manage time wisely, and to speak graciously, all for the glory of His name. Let's pray. Lord, as we have come to Your Word, I pray that throughout the week we will be able to be affected and able to apply it in many, many different ways. In particular, your word says, continue steadfastly in prayer. That's what you want for us. I pray that it will not be 15 orcas. I pray that the whole church, whether they sign up or not, will be steadfast in prayer, asking for opportunities, praying for opportunities to others, praying that you will protect these people in all parts of the world, giving us opportunities to proclaim your gospel, that it may save many. Amen.